They claim the soul Bible has outlived its day. That there are some changes that need to be made. Let no man deceive. Take your Bibles or turn with me to Matthew 24. Truth is determined by the test of time. Welcome to Antichrist Ministries Wednesday Bible Study. I'm Brother David. The name of the program is King James Version Exposed. Because we use the King James Version, we look at all the verses, break them down, and bring them to life and expose the meaning. Once again, this is Empty Cross Ministries Wednesday Bible Study. Today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 36, 37, and 38. Then we're going to jump clear over to Acts chapter 2, look at verses 16 through 21, and then jump down to Acts 21, look at verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> what we're going to do is I'm going to read all of our scriptures, and then we'll go back and look at each one and break it down and bring it to life. Luke chapter 2, verses 36, 37, and 38 beginning in verse 36. Once again, I am reading from the King James Version. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. <clears throat> and she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Israel. Now we're going to jump over to Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 21, beginning in verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by, by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass... In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the next day we were... A this is Acts chapter 21, now verses 8 through 9, beginning in verse 8. And the next day we were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins which did prophesy. Our key verse is Acts chapter 2, verse 17. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young man shall see visions, and your old man shall dream dreams. Are you willing to tell others? Let's take a look at that phrase. Sir. Consider the following actual and planned ministries. Some of those mentioned work in dangerous settings, so no names are used here. A woman, woman A, planned to go to a country so remote and so expensive to get to that no missionary organization would sponsor the idea. She went anyway. Woman B, a missionary in the Far East, is age 91 and still working. Woman C, a tiny but bold person rescues children in danger of sex trafficking. Woman D, 
against the advice of others in a certain foreign country, visited Buddhist temples and spent time talking about Jesus with the monks there. Woman E deliberately hires non-Christians to work for her Christian ministry in order to influence and help them. Woman F has plans to minister to shrine and temple prostitutes. Yes, there is still such a thing. Woman G would sing in bars free of charge if management would let her include a Christian song with each set. We might wonder at the apparent lack of preparation of some of the, of some of what I just mentioned. But God isn't interested in perfection. He's interested in willingness. Where are you in your preparation for ministry? Are you waiting until you're perfect? If so, you will never answer God's call when it comes. Few of us will preach to massive crowds or build a mega church. But through His Spirit, God recruits people for amazing assignments. Nonetheless, this lesson tonight touches on just a few of those examples. <clears throat> Let's put this lesson into context with Judaism. We're going to, in this, uh, in this quarter anyway, we're looking at examples of faithful women in the first century church. All three of tonight's lesson texts come from the author of Luke. Analysis of his two books, Luke and Acts, shows that he had special regard for women. Look at Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 14, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Luke chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, and Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and Acts chapter 16, Verse 13. These texts and others affords an opportunity to celebrate stories that are sometimes overlooked. These women, named or not, played important roles in the ministry of Jesus that continued in the church. The Jews of Luke's day lived not only in Palestine, but also in enclaves of Greek and Roman cities throughout the empire. For example, look at Acts chapter 2, verse 5. Acts chapter 6, verse 9. Acts chapter 14, verse 1. Jews maintain their own practices regarding women's roles as directed by their understanding of scripture and family structure from ancient times. In general, a Jewish female was attached to a man who served as her provider, protector, and authority. Normally, a father held this role for a daughter and a husband for a wife. Devout Jews honored God's concern for widows. Look at De Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 19. These often were older women who had no opportunities to remarry or be employed. For them, the likelihood of having a male provider was limited, necessitating help from the, com from the community. Compare this with Acts chapter 6 verses 1 through 7 and James chapter 1, verse 27. Women were allowed to attend synagogue gatherings, but only as observers. They were usually seated in a balcony or in some other section apart from men. The temple in Jerusalem that was rebuilt after the exile had a courtyard for women beyond which women were not allowed. Now we're going to put this lesson into context with paganism. Jewish communities experiencing varying degrees of influence from Greek and Roman cultures. As the Roman Empire expanded, Romans brought their traditions to their conquered peoples. Roman society was dominated by man at all levels, business, politics, government, and military. But some women gained influence by their association with powerful men. In particular, some wives of the emperors achieved notoriety and celebrity. Sometimes mothers, wives, or sisters would even appear on the coinage of an emperor. Women also played an important role in the civic religion of Rome. While the revered festal virgins recognized as maintaining the ancient traditions 
of the city. However, the primary sphere of influence for Roman women was within the home, where they managed the household and saw to the proper raising of children. The Romans idealized the matron, the upper-class woman who managed her home well and remained chaste, modest, and loyal to her husband, and in many cases, in spite of his own lack of sexual fidelity. Although the Greeks had been conquered by the Romans, Greek culture survived and remained influential in reshaping society. Greek culture, like that of the Romans, was male-dominated. The home was considered to be the proper realm of women. The Greeks, however, were not as uniformly tradition-bound as the Romans in this regard. Some Greek women were people of business and their wealth gave them influence in their communities. Compare this with Acts chapter 17, verse 12. Even so, relationships with families varied in pagan cultures. Some husbands loved and respected their wives and saw them as equal partners in life. Other men had little affection for their wives and might abuse or ignore them with few consequences from society outside the home. Wives often tolerated sexual infidelity by man, but women who were unfaithful were liable to divorce, disgrace, and even death. No one considered this to be a double standard, but simply the proper state of things in society. The prominence of even a few women in the New Testament accounts is therefore both surprising and instructive. Our first section of uh, scripture could be titled, In the Temple. When Jesus was eight days old, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem, to the Jerusalem temple to consecrate him as required by, by Scripture. Look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, and look at Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. In the temple courts, the little family encountered two people who were waiting for the Messiah. One was a widow named Anna, which we're going to consider in the next verses. Also look at Luke chapter 2, verses 25 and 36. The first part of verse 36 reads, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Aser. Anna is a Greek form of the name Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20. Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving for Samuel echoes throughout Mary's song of praise. Luke likely appreciated this further connection to that time past when a long-for baby was born. A prophet or prophetess is someone chosen by God to speak for him as he brings something to mind. In the Old Testament, four women are designated as being prophetesses, Miriam, Deborah, and the unnamed wife of Isaiah. Though their words are not recorded at length like those of Moses or Jeremiah, these women served in the same ways by communicating what God revealed to them for the people. The mention of Anna's the mention of Anna's father, Phanuel, suggests that he was a well remembered resident of Jerusalem, as Luke wrote in this account. His name means face of God or presence of God. This implies his religious dedication, a faithfulness that was passed down to his daughter. Fittingly, his daughter would see God face to face when she met the baby Jesus. The tribe of Asher. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. The tribe of Asher was one of the ten northern tribes destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Though many were taken into captivity at that time, others were left behind. Some became the people known as Samaritans through intermarriage with non-Israelites. Anna's family apparently was left in the land but did not intermarry with other peoples, thus remained recognizably as being from a tribe. First is the second part of verse 36 and the first part of verse 37 read. 
She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. Four score and four years can refer either to Anna's age, which would be 84 years old, or to the approximate amount of time she had been widowed. Either possibility means that she was old enough to remember when the Romans conquered the Jewish homeland in 63 B.C. The second part of verse 37 reads, Which she parted not from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers night and day. Rather than find a new spouse, Anna devoted herself to spiritual service within the temple. She fasted, probably weekly, and prayed, surely daily. Though she literally may not ever have left the temple, more likely the language is meant to emphasize her continual devotion to serving God. Brings me to a what do you think question. What role should fasting play in your own devotional time? Why do you say that? Let's dig a little bit deeper. How do the presidents in Esther chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 and Acts chapter 13 verses 2 and 3 and Acts chapter 14 verse 23 help frame your answer? We now come to verse 38, an expressive witness. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that look for redemption in Israel. Anna's words reveal that she had messianic expectations for Jesus. Recognizing redemption to be at hand was a fulfillment of prophecy. Look at Isaiah chapter two, chapter 52, verse 9. However, what is meant precisely by redemption in Jerusalem is not clear. To redeem means to buy back or deliver from danger. Look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 29 and verse 48, and Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Anna could, like many others, have national politics in mind. Redemption would mean that Judea, like Israel of old, would be its own sovereign nation again. That would have had special appeal because Anna was old enough to remember when Rome became the official power in Judea. Memories of life before Rome were enticing, even if those times were less than peaceful. Or she could have the more spiritual redemption from sins in mind. The Spirit did not fill in any incomplete understanding Anna may have had regarding Jesus' role. This should be a comfort to us all as we catch, as we each know only in part. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. God sees fit to use whatever faithful understanding we have to witness to others, just as Anna witnessed to Mary and Joseph that day in the temple. Brings me to another what do you think question. If you are a senior citizen, what methods of witness and service can you focus on that those of the younger generation might not do as well at? Let's dig a little bit deeper there. If you are not a senior citizen, what can you do to support their witness and service? We now come to the second section of our scripture in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 continues the story of Jesus' followers after his resurrection and ascension. A group of about 120 remained in Jerusalem, including the apostles minus Judas, Jesus' brothers, and a group of women that included Mary, Jesus' mother. On Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, the Holy Spirit descended on this group in spectacular fashion. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This dramatic event drew a, drew a diverse crowd as an audience for Peter. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. It was an ideal setting to explain the significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus. We now come to verses 16 through 18. Verse 16 reads, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The word this refers to the speaking and hearing in the native language of those gathered. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 11. By way of explanation, 
Peter's quotation spoken by the prophet Joel that follows comes from Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32. Verses 17 and 18 read, And it shall come to pass, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. The prophet Joel, about whom we know virtually nothing, had foreseen the day of the Lord centuries earlier. That day would be a time when God would intervene dramatically in the history of Israel. Look at Joel chapter 2 verse 1. The last days refers to the beginning of the final era in God's plan for humanity. We have been in these last days for some 2,000 years now. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20, 1 John chapter 2 verse 18. A widespread distribution of God's Spirit would be a sign that the new era has dawned. The, inclusive, the inclusion of Gentiles was anticipated by the phrase by the phrase all flesh. Compare this with Galatians chapter 3 verses 26 through 29. Then, lest he be misunderstood, Joel inclusively specified both genders and the spectrum of age groups as conduits for God's communication. Those whom society or culture previously viewed as being ineligible to speak on behalf of God would be empowered to do just that. Joel's prophecy reveals that God's eligibility criteria are not necessarily what people expect. Peter spoke as if this prophecy was fulfilled, implying that some of the female followers of Jesus already had received this gift. What do you think? Another what do you think question. How should you react if someone comes to you claiming to have received a message from God in a dream or vision? Let's dig a little bit deeper here. Which text help best in framing your decision? Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. Acts chapter 10, verses 3 through 19. Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 10. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 10. Acts 26, verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 12 through 13. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Second John chapter 9, and Jude 8, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. We now come to verses 19 and 20. Wonders and signs. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. The specific wonders and signs noted here did not occur on the day of Pentecost. Even so, there were supernatural sounds and visual phenomena that accompanied the coming of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. This part of the prophecy may point ahead to the second coming of Christ, Compare this with Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 28. Verse 21 reads, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The, the events of the day of Pentecost were not primarily about the miraculous giving of the Holy Spirit or about the inclusion of both genders in prophetic ministry. The scope of salvation is more than welcoming men and women equally, and much more than the ability to prophesy. Rather, the primary issue is the announcement of salvation to all who call on the name of the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Peter himself did not, at this point, fully understand the sweeping nature of the word whosoever, given his growing understanding in Acts chapter 10, verses Acts chapter 10, verse 1 through Acts chapter 11, verse 18. Not included in today's text is the crowd's reaction 
of asking what they must do, and Peter's calling them to repent and be baptized, that we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We now come to the third part of our scripture, in Caesarea. <clears throat> this brief account occurred near the end of Paul's third missionary journey in A.D. 58. Thus, more than two decades had passed since the day of Pentecost. At the point where we join the narrative, Paul and companions were nearing the end of their multi-stop sea voyage. Verse 8 reads, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the, evan the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Luke, the author of this narrative, was a traveling companion of Paul. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. And was with him at the time of this incident. This is indicated by the use of the word we. In reading of the arrival of Paul's company unto Caesarea, we take care to observe that this is the coastal city of Caesarea, Mar Maritima, not the inland town of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Maritima served as a Roman administrative center and military headquarters, about 60 miles northwest of Jerusalem. This city figures prominently in the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 30, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, and verse 24, Acts chapter 11, verse 11, Acts chapter 12, verse 19, Acts chapter 18, verse 22, and Acts chapter 23, verse 33. Philip the, evangel Philip the Evangelist, who is not to be confused with the Apostle Philip, lived in Caesarea. He is one of the seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, chosen for the ministry described in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He later crossed cultural boundaries to preach the gospel to Samaritans and then to an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip's home became a way station for Paul as he journeyed to Jerusalem for the final time. Brings me to another what do you think question. What do you think? What do the changing roles of Philip the Evangelist teach you about how to react to God's changing calls on your life? Let's dig a little bit deeper here. In what ways does the further consideration of Stephen's changing roles cause you to modify your answer, if at all. Look at Acts chapter 6 and 7. We now come to verse 9. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. The description of Philip's four daughters as virgins indicates their status as being unmarried. As such, they lived in their father's house where Paul was staying. The four daughters which did prophesy and their evangelist father were likely well known to Luke's readers and were celebrated as servants among fellow Christians in the area. Although this is a reasonable conclusion by inference, nothing further is recorded of Philip and his daughters. And we come to one last what do you think question. In what ways can you better encourage fellow believers to use their spiritual gifts. Let's dig a bit, little bit deeper here. Are the best ways to encourage women to do so the same best ways to encourage men? Why or why not? We now come to our conclusion. An aged widow, a group of women who had followed Jesus and remained in Jerusalem after his ascension, a band of four unmarried sisters, the New Testament offers these as examples of first century women who were endowed with the gift of prophecy. Important questions exist regarding whether the spiritual gift of prophecy continues yet today. Look at Zechariah chapter 13 verses 1 through 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 through 12, and Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. But those questions, as important as they are, are not the focus of this lesson. The focus, rather, is on using one's giftedness in answering God's call to ministry. 
As one observer put it, when the church is working properly, every woman, as well as every man, will be using at least one spiritual gift and ministry to others in the body of Christ. Also look at the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. We're going to close out here with a short prayer and a song. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the prophetic voice that you have given to your people. We thank you for the examples of Anna, the Pentecost women, and the daughters of Philip as faithful people who served you. May we be as faithful. We pray in the name of Jesus, in whom we are one. Amen. As we close out here, I'll leave you with this thought to remember. God gives people for ministry according to His will and plans, not ours. Folks, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. And we're going to close out here with a song. As soon as I get to it. Folks, stay safe, be blessed, stay in the Word, and write the Word upon your heart. Until next time. I'm going to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready, Lord, to walk in Jerusalem just like John. I'm going to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready, Lord, to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Oh, John, oh, John, now what do you say? Walking in Jerusalem just like John. I'll meet you there on the ground and there. Walking in Jerusalem just like John. Walking in Jerusalem just like John. Tell all my friends that I'm coming to. Walking in Jerusalem just like John.